All right, everyone. Thanks uh, for coming through and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous communities whose land Arizona State University is based on. And it's due to their custodianship that we're able to operate on that piece of land. Now, when we think about virus ecology, and this is a paper that Gary Pacifica, Panishila, and I wrote, uh, basically kind of highlighting some of the key concepts when you think about virus ecology. You know, there are people dwelling, studying viruses at just a virus level, some more at a virus-virus interaction, and we can move through all these different ways, and we can study viruses in all different contexts. But we're getting to a level where we actually want to figure out what viruses are doing in ecosystems. And the primary thing is that if all viruses were fatal in nature, there would be no organisms on this planet. So they must be doing something good. They must be beneficial. And we're studying them in a variety of different ways and a variety of groups are actually pioneering this area of community ecology, population ecology, and viruses at an ecosystems level with a variety of different factors in mind. So if we take a step back from thinking about the big virus picture, we need to go to the fundamentals of virology in the sense that these elements, these genetic molecules are unique in the sense that they can be single-stranded, double-stranded, and also DNA can be single-stranded or double-stranded, same with the RNA. So they come in a variety of genome types. And within this context, the replication machinery is all different. And this is very important because some of these replication machinery is important because those are our tethering points for recognizing viruses because this large diversity of virus pool, it's very difficult to recognize them if we have never studied them before. So we're using this cons conserved proteins to try and analyze these different types of viruses. And if you look at kind of what is known about viruses so far, we start seeing this really, really weird pattern here in the sense that archaea are very undersampled and we're missing archaea in pretty much um, RNA domains in terms of RNA genomes. But we see a general spread of viruses and in terms of bacteria, we see a lot more in the space of DNA as opposed to RNA, and that RNA side of it is all coming through more and more. But along these lines, like what is generating virus diversity? We need to know some of the basic fundamentals of it. And what is important is that viruses evolve by substitution, nucleotide substitution, errors during replication, and so forth. But in the event an error has been introduced into a beneficial or a very important gene, then to repair that, if it is deleterious, to repair it by mutation itself is very difficult, right? And in that context, second kind of mechanism of evolution comes in and that's called recombination. And recombination is very, very common in a lot of viruses, primarily when there is a co-infection with very similar genomes. And what happens during that stage is during replication, you get template hopping taking place, generating these huge swaths of chimeric molecules that can very, very easily uh, kind of fix or repair some of these mutations that have, could have come through from single uh, nucleotide substitutions. And then there are other viruses which are segmented and multipartite, and these are the gems in the sense that they can have their genomes encapsulated into different capsids, yet they are a collective unit and they need to be transferred to be functional. Same thing when we look at some viruses like influenza virus that are segmented, all the segments, you can think of these segments as chromosomes are all pretty much packaged into one variant. But if there is a co-infection, there is reassortment taking place. So you can actually generate a lot of different variants. And I call this modularity. Modularity is very, very important to adapting to new ecosystems as opposed to things within a fixed genome. Now, Earlier, I mentioned some of the shared proteins amongst viruses, and this is really staggering because one would think that RNA viruses would have proteins that are very similar to other RNA viruses. But we start seeing certain things like the single jelly roll capsid structure that is also present in RNA viruses, but shared amongst a lot of DNA viruses of both single-stranded and DNA, uh, double-stranded DNA viruses. And in that similar context, there are a variety of different proteins that are shared across different types of viruses be it single-stranded or double-stranded RNA or DNA. So from here, we can start thinking about concepts of evolution much more deeper. And we look at concepts of evolution, 
we have certain things that we need to start tackling, taxonomy. How do we bend this virus? Humans are inherently kind of in an environment where we want to name things and put things into little bins. You know, we go into our wardrobe, our socks are in one drawer, our t-shirts are in another drawer, et cetera. We like putting things into different places. In the same context, we start putting text, things into a taxonomic framework because it helps us to discuss these viruses in different ways, to actually find some similarities, et cetera. And if you look at it, we can try put them into a variety of different categories. And then as you see, you get into the family level, there are some viral-like elements that are actually not assigned to any families, uh, sorry, any orders. They're kind of free floating at the moment because we're beginning to discover these new things, trying to figure out where they sit. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about these very, very unusual single-stranded DNA viruses because they're fascinating because number one, we all know from basic molecular biology that single-stranded DNA is not stable, double-stranded DNA is stable. So why do these viruses adopt a genome architecture that is single-stranded? What are the benefits of it? And why are they so diverse and all over the place? And the way we recognize all of these viruses is because of these two motifs, the endonuclease motif that is involved in replication by actually nicking a site of the single double-stranded intermediate during replication, and then the helicase motif that basically starts initiating, uh, splitting or separating the two strands, and then post-polymerases come through and start replicating them. So when we look at these single-stranded DNA viruses, the second aspect of it, which I really find fascinating is, the organisms that they infect are in a variety of different domains. So this is great because these viruses are relatively small in terms of the genome size and can be found in pretty much all environments and infecting different organisms. And for us, we're interested in evolution. This becomes very important because we're interested in full genomes, not just one gene, because the non-coding regions are equally important in kind of evolution of these viruses because they could have regulatory elements in a variety of so when we study these kind of viruses, we start noticing certain really interesting trends. For example, if you look at the replication associated protein that has the endonuclease and the helicase domain, we split them and they're all on one protein. These two domains are on one protein. We split that protein in half, draw the phylogenies, and we notice that in some cases, the phylogenies are congruent, but in a lot of cases, they're not congruent. And this is telling us that somewhere way before in evolution, compared to what we can detect at the nucleotide level, there has been recombination that has taken place within these protein modules. And that's why we're seeing this incongruent phylogeny in a lot of cases. Then the other question is, where have these viruses evolved? Origins of viruses. And this becomes very fascinating. And if you start looking at mainly the helicase domain, because we know helicase are present in bacteria, in plasmids, and a variety of different things, Using bipartite networks, we can start figuring out that some of the helicases in plasmids uh, are, and bacteria are very closely related to those we find in eukaryotic elements, but those are also related to those in these Kresna viruses that we find. Some of them have connections to Petorna viruses, but then through parvoviruses, we're able to also tap into the helicase domains of poliomaviruses and papillomaviruses but we're also getting these weird plant plasmids that we start, sorry, these algal plasmids that we start seeing some of these things in related to. And using this kind of mechanism, we can start actually understanding the deeper evolution of these viruses and then go on to proposing hypotheses where some of these viruses would have evolved from, from plasmid-like elements that have somehow acquired a jelly roll capsid protein. And then some of those have then kind of resulted in formation of other plasmids. Others have resulted in more complex plasmids through which other jelly roll capsid proteins have been acquired, leading to a variety of different viruses through the mechanism. So a lot of this is theoretical at the moment, but it's based on the knowledge that we have of the capsid proteins, and we can start building some of the evolutionary uh, um, origins of some of these single-stranded DNA viruses and also double-stranded DNA viruses. But when we look at all these single-stranded DNA viruses, they recombine a lot. And we see the recombination hotspots pretty much in the non-coding regions and in the 
coding regions, there are cold spots showing that it is very important evolutionary and through natural selection for coding regions not to be disrupted. And so this is kind of what we see in nature. But the other thing that we see is that even in segmented or multipartite viruses, if you take the cognate molecules and growth phylogenies, they're not congruent. So that means that there is modularity in these viruses that actually are bipartite. And the way I like the concept of modularity, it's almost like trading. You go into a new host and you're like, okay, I need this extra protein or I need this extra uh, accessory item. And so you can trade and you can pick and move and choose. And so this becomes a very, very important concept in some of the evolution of some of these viruses. But beyond just recombination and reassortment kind of com complexes, we look at the substitution rate of a lot of these single-stranded viruses some of these are calculated, others are experimentally determined. We see that their substitution rates are really high. They're almost similar to those substitution rates that have been identified in a variety of RNA viruses that use RNA-dependent RNA polymerases that, are RN, that, are, that have low fidelity. So this is staggering for us. And it's like, why is it that these viruses have such high mutation rates? And, especially when they use host polymerases for the replication. Now, the other thing is obviously going to be genome plasticity. And genome plasticity in viruses is going to be governed by the capsid protein fold. So if the capsid protein can accommodate a certain amount of nucleic acid, then you can allow for plasticity. But if it can't, then that genome is not going to get packaged into the interregion inter of that uh, capsid. But in some of these viruses, we're noticing there is genome plasticity. Here's a very good example in the Begoma virus, which is a bipartite, where there is one segment here and a second segment. We're beginning to find a group of viruses, which are plant infecting, where basically that element has been incorporated into the main molecule and it's increased in size. Now, the bigger question here is, how are they packaging this larger genome? Now, geminate particles are very unique. The two icosahedrons fuse together at a slight offset. So does that mean this larger molecule is three geminate parts, so three axolahedra particles fused together in different conformation? And we do not think that it changes completely into a different structure. So these kind of modularity becomes very important because it also adds to genetic diversity, but changes the dynamics in the sense that did those evolve from here to genome reduction, or is it the other way that you've got that wasn't working really efficiently, so acquisition of this meant that it could be a single module rather than a bimodular uh, molecule. Now, going to the single-stranded part of it, remember I said the single-stranded DNA viruses are unusual and really interesting for us, primarily because why single-stranded when double-stranded DNA is much more stable? So what we have done is we've taken all of these single-stranded DNA virus genomes available in GenBank, and we've got pushed them through in silico folding, so secondary structure of the nucleic acid itself, to see if the nucleic acid will fold back on itself, form this complex secondary structure. And when we look at them, we start finding a lot of interaction networks. And when we start studying this at greater detail, we see that purifying selection is strongest at paired nucleoside, nucleotide sites. We also start seeing that synonymous substitution rates are very low at paired genomic sites. In all the evolution experiments that we've done, we see that these mutations are accumulating in the unpaired site. And the most fascinating thing for us was that we see this concept of complementary coevolution. And so if that particular nucleotide mutates from a T to a G, then there'll be a compensatory mutation here from an A to a C to maintain that secondary structure. So this is interesting because it's showing that there is genomic interaction at a nucleotide level between two sites that are far away that then come together to form these secondary structures. And a lot of these secondary structures are important. In some cases, they're regulatory elements. They're almost where some of the proteins bind, recognizing the secondary structure. So this is kind of fascinating things that we start noticing in these things. So now I'm going to start walking us through some small groups of viruses that I think are fascinating. So Gemini viruses are these plant-infecting viruses that have geminate particles. Very, very simple genome architecture where they have a movement protein, a capsid protein, a replication initiator protein. And so we've been fascinated by this from an evolution perspective. 
And in a theoretical framework, we can say, let's say we take two viruses that are 10% similar to each other. We chop them in half, make reciprocal chimeras, put them into an environment where they can replicate. We can see what is going on. We can get simple recombination events, complex recombination events. And then in some cases, we'll get deletions and insertions of a variety of different genomic elements from the host. And then we can take these things and study their fitness to see that in an evolution experiment, are these then fit in nature? So what is going through in terms of exploring fitness landscape? And here's an example of what we've done. So the simple example, we've taken two viruses that are about 10% different. One infects maize, another one grass. Both of them are poesy, so they're both crosses. And we can make reciprocal chimeras of this, put them into a host element like a plant. In this case, it was maize. Leave them for 30 days, let them explore sequence space. What is really fascinating is they come back to this optimal solution that is present in nature today in 30 days. So they explore 10% sequence space in 30 days to get to the optimal solution that we find in nature today. So this kind of stuff is staggering and very important for us to see evolutionary trajectories of viruses in a variety of systems. And in the same way, what we can do is we can start actually studying phylogeography of viruses because we have actually calibrated the molecular clock in terms of substitution rates. We can look at the recombination patterns, remove the recombination patterns, from the genomes because recombination accelerates evolution. And then say, okay, maize as a crop was introduced onto the African continent, and now it's riddled with this one pathogen. How did it happen? And so maize was introduced into West Africa and Southern Africa around 16 and 8, 1700. And around 1900, there was this emergence of a new pathogen that the farmers were really freaked out about because they were losing a lot of their crop. And through a variety of different things, including sampling indigenous grasses, et cetera, we're able to actually try, look at the movement of these viruses in terms of the evolved here in Southern Africa, around Zimbabwe, South Africa, and then have moved into Kenya, into West Africa. But we can also date all of these nodes all the way back here to around 1860, when these viruses have emerged from indigenous grasses. And this is also the same time when the early settlers were actually ramping up all the agricultural activities on the continent. And this was roughly 250, uh, 250 years after the introduction of the crop. So that means the evolution didn't happen overnight. But 250 years is a very small time frame within an evolutionary pattern of viruses in general. Okay, the next I'll talk about is really, really unique uh, viruses which are possibly some of my favorite viruses called nanoviruses. And I like them because I see them as modular elements. So these nanoviruses come in like segmented viruses uh, where they have six or eight segments, each one of them encoding a different protein, but they have a common region. So for example, this molecule is responsible for replicating all of that. This molecule is responsible for encapsidating all of those and so forth. So that means they have to work as a collective, but each one is packaged into a different particle. So they have to go into host, somehow find their molecules and the proteins, get to the right place, and they function as a unit. But you can also see this as a modularity. If you lose one element, are you then impaired in the function in terms of an infection? And when we studied this viruses in great detail, these ones here, banana bunch it up, as the name suggests, infect uh, bananas, and a major problem globally, other than in the Americas where this virus is not found. But when we study these viruses, we find a lot of recombination taking place. But when we look at these viruses as a collective, we also see recombination taking place pretty much in this common regions here. So they're not recombining with like with like, but they're also combining across the board, which is fascinating for us because that means it can generate genetic diversity very, very quickly and generate new unique molecules. They reassort like crazy. We can see a reassortment all over the place when we study this across the world. And using this kind of phylogeographic analysis, we can start figuring out when this virus has emerged. We know they have a last common ancestor around 900 uh, from so somewhere around in Southeast Asia. And then they've moved into what we think into the Indian subcontinent. And from there, they moved into a variety of different places. 
my hypothesis of movement here is the British through their colonization moved the material from Indian subcontinent to some of the areas that they occupied. And here in Pacific Island of Tonga, we're seeing this event here. This is all an introduction from Fiji, which used to be a British colony where they were planting a lot of sugarcane. And so with that, they've taken a lot of laborers as well as different types of planting material around the world. And here is where I start seeing some fascinating things is mainly in Australia, which is the strongest quarantine environment in the world. They've had two incursions of this pathogen that's come in at different time points. So you can do really, really fascinating things and start dating these things. And maybe with this, working with historians, you can start looking at movement patterns of how humans have moved pathogens around the globe without thinking about it. Now, going on to certain other viruses, like the circa viruses, which are actually quite important in a variety of industries, sorry, primarily in the porcine industry, but also in the pet trade industry with parrots. And here's an example of a circa virus infecting a parrot. This is a sulfur crested cockatoo, traveled around the world, spent the last 20 years in an Australian pub, it was very talkative, but you can see that that beak is deformed, it's lost most of the feathers. And that's as a result of this pathogen called beak and feather disease virus. And this kind of things we can start looking at in greater detail. Here's a very beautiful example where I was called into New Caledonia by an illegal breeder where he had lost a whole lot of his breeding flock to this pathogen. And I'd asked him to send me some feather samples. And so on feathers at the calamus, there's enough blood and cells that we can actually look at viruses. And also we can sex the birds based on that. And so I analyzed all of that and I was like, straight away asked him, did he buy a pair of breeding parrots from Europe? Because all of these are European sequences. And he's like, yes. And I was like, well, you've just infected your entire population of birds in your facility through this introduction. And what we see, these are endemic BFDV in rainbow lorikeets in New Caledonia. So you can see these introductions of viruses very, very quickly. And when we look at breeding facilities, and breeding facilities are notorious for bringing animals from all over the world, putting them into aviaries. Now we travel, we go to hubs, big airports, we're stressed, had a cranky flight, and our immune systems are slightly down. We're meeting all of these people from other parts of the world, and it is a awesome hub for transmission of viruses. And so this is what's happening, is that in these breeding facilities, here's some work we did in Poland, uh, in the breeding facilities, recombination is rife across a variety of different parrot species. We also start seeing genomes of viruses that are 70% recombinant. So only 30% is what was ancestral in that. So these viruses are just having a field day through this legal and illegal trafficking of animals through these systems. And because I worked on uh, these diseases in parrots and the situation of feather loss, uh, David Ainley is a very well-known penguin biologist, came out to see me while I was based in New Zealand, and he said that in the penguin colonies in the Antarctic, they're seeing this feather loss in a variety of uh, Adelie penguin chicks. Do I think it is a similar thing? And that's kind of where my journey into this part of the world starts, is the next thing I knew, I was part of a big Antarctic program studying penguins. But with that, I started building networks to study a variety of different Antarctic animals, both above ground, above water and below water. And we're also doing a lot of work with fish. And so for the last 10 years, we've built an Antarctic program on virology around this area. And it was only about three years ago that we noticed for the second time, these penguins without feathers or had feather deformities. And we were able to sample some of these animals, not blood or anything but the environmental samples around it so them defecating an area and we're able to identify a virus that is very similar to beacon feather disease virus so all these avian viruses um, and we were able to also see it at a different place which is pretty much at the peninsula with a british antarctic team so this means that these viruses are also endemic in a variety of these birds across the system and we're building on this work even more now and with this kind of work, we start getting involved in a variety of different projects. Here's us working with Waddell seals. We've done a lot of fecal sampling of Waddell seals because these seals come out to sea ice. 
to give birth to the pups. And so these mothers and pups that we can uh, sample and they're, we've sampled uh, vaginal swabs, nasal swabs, as well as taken a lot of fecal samples. And in about 80 fecal samples, we find this one group of virus, which is very, very dominant. And it's, it's a member of the Circoviridae family, but we look at it in detail. And in the replication associated protein, we start seeing in the genomes of a variety of parasitic tapeworms and cestodes, we start seeing these integrated sequences that are full of indels, top codons, et cetera. And so we're now able to highly likely put a putative host to these viruses that we've identified that they're actually infecting nematodes. And nematodes are very important in Waddell seals. They pretty much line their guts and help them prime their immune system quite constantly. Okay, and so going in from there, we move into another area, which I think is fascinating, which we haven't usually thought about is protists and viruses infecting protists. And here is a paper that came out a couple of years ago from Carmack and Lear's group, where they identified these viruses infecting Antamoeba and Jardia. And they were very kind to kind of think of the Lord of the Rings and then name or putatively name families of these viruses based on the three rings uh, from Middle Earth. And so certainly this became a challenge for Mark Kuprovich and I. And the next thing we did is we est basically established the families, the genera, the species, all based around the Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth by using names. So taxonomy is not just boring and mundane. <laughs> it can be creative as long as you have a creative mind. And this, is folks are absolutely enjoying this. And we've tried to put all this information in. So if you want a revision of Middle Earth and Tolkien's world, you can come and have a look at this. Okay, so going to these viruses that they've identified, what we start noticing is we start noticing we're finding these viruses in yellow bellied summits in Colorado. So we did some field work in Colorado. We find them there. We find them a lot in rodents in Arizona, but also we're finding them in haboobs. So these are dust zones in Arizona that pick up the dust from the Southern Sonoran Desert. So in Mexico, Northern Mexico, and then dump it in Phoenix where I live. So it's, we're beginning to see these patterns, so which is really fascinating, but we can tether them all based on the replication associated protein. But we look at the capsid protein, they actually have different capsid proteins. So this is really fascinating that it, at some point in evolution, there has been this exchange of capsid protein. Similarly, when we look at these other ones that are infecting Jardia, we find them pretty common in rodents. And so now my big task is to see what is the incidence of Jardia in rodents in Arizona. And not only in Arizona, these things have been identified in Russia in northern red black wolves as well. So now we're trying to decipher where all of this is moving. But we look at the capsid proteins are actually a lot more concerned. So this is kind of where we're kind of working in from here. And then going to the mystery. And this virus group, Nella viruses are mysterious. They're mysterious for a variety of reasons. Number one, they only have a capsid protein. They do not encode a replication associated protein. So we don't know who replicates them or who initiates the replication. And they're pretty much present in all mammals that we know. In humans, there are certain populations of humans that are 100% infected, but we do not know what the pathology is. We do know that if an individual is immunosuppressed, these viruses are elevated in terms of their numbers. And in the Antarctic, we've done a lot of work on these things. We do this work in all sorts of different animals, but I'm gonna give you an example in the Antarctic. We find this is the diversity in primates. This is the diversity in 20 Waddell seals. So from a diversity perspective, it's huge, but what is even more fascinating is these things, we might be able to use them as proxies for trophic interaction. Here's an example. We're starting to find them in South Polar Skuas. These are birds that migrate to the South, uh, to the Southern Ocean, so they come and actually breed in Antarctic, and they're obviously predate on penguin chicks and eggs. And we start finding these viruses in these, so I quickly asked the ecologist in the Antarctic, why would South Polar Skuas have anelloviruses that are those of Waddell seals? And they're like, oh, that's very, very obvious. 
they feed on the placenta of the pups. So indirectly, they're acquiring this. And as you can see, based on this tree, this is the phylogeny of the host, phylogeny of the anellovirus or one protein. There's a lot of congruence with the phylogeny other than this in porcine, there are two lineages. So then with this, can we start actually finding out who some of the hosts might be? And I'll give you a simple example. Recently, we did some work on grizzly bears. And in the fecal sample of grizzly bears, we found a polyoma virus. It was like, oh, wow, this is very unique, never seen before. We dug deeper into it, and we find anelloviruses that are very similar to that of a pig or pigs. So like, oh, so the grizzly bear had a diet, a meal, that was either a wild boar or some sort of a pig. And likely was someone who was camping in there, lost a pig. So we think those are kind of the ways we could start looking at trophic interactions by using uh, conserved viruses that have co-evolved with their host. And the same thing that we can do in felids, we see a lot of diversity, different genome sizes, and these are different felids around the planet. But we've been working on bobcats, uh, Canada lynx, not much on domestic cats, but a little bit, ocelot, pumas, caracals, and we start seeing three clear lineages. This lineage we think is derived from diet by eating little rodents in the desert, because these are very rodent-derived anelloviruses. But to us, what is fascinating is some of these domestic cat ones are scattered, but these caracal ones are sitting here, which are very similar to Canada lynx and some in bobcats. And these cats have been separated completely because caracals are found in South Africa and they'll go up to the African continent. So they're completely disconnected from the Americas. So why are these viruses so similar? And we think is that there was a lineage where both of those uh, viruses ended up in these two different, and then, then through selection, some have kind of moved across. So there are multiple lineages at the last common ancestor that were moved across. Okay, so to start wrapping up, I want to talk a little bit about slightly bigger viruses than single-stranded DNA viruses that are small. Going on to polyoma viruses, and these are kind of oncogenic viruses, but We've been doing a lot of work in fish and identifying a lot of very, very unique viruses in fish. And so you can see these are the ones generally infecting mammals. There's this group infecting birds. We found them in Adelie penguins. We found them in Adelie seals in the Antarctic. But now we're beginning to find them in Antarctic fish as well. And this is important for us because it starts bringing us back to an evolution point in terms of where did these viruses come from, were they present in a lot of the early ancestors of organisms that then occupied uh, terrestrial systems? And at times you start asking some weird questions, which I usually do. And this is an example of you move to a different part of the world and you're like, what is in my backyard? Scorpions. And so before we knew it, like we were sampling scorpions in our backyards at home. And we thought, let's see what scorpions have. And in about five scorpions, we find a variety of new undescribed polyoma viruses that are the last common ancestor to currently known polyoma viruses. And when we dig through databases, we start seeing similar sequences have also been found or related sequences have also been found in other arachnids. So we've actually identified an entire lineage of arachnid specific polyoma viruses that was never known. So now we know that we can go further back in terms of evolutionary time. And using these kind of concepts, we can say, was there a polyoma virus type that then resulted in an arthropod or a variant? Then there was a fish variant. And then through a variety of mechanisms, you're getting these recombinant individuals coming through, uh, through these two other sublineages. So we can start studying this much more deeper as long as we have all this information that we collect from our metagenomic studies. Similarly, we look at papillomaviruses, and I think this is somewhere, something that we're all familiar with, primarily because if some of the human papillomaviruses are associated with cervical and head and neck cancers. And with that, you know, papillomaviruses are pretty abundant in most organisms. In a lot of cases, they're benign, but we have certain variants that do cause uh, cancer. And if we look at Waddell seals, we see them pretty much scattered all over. So is this a signal that is strong that says there's coevolution? 
We think not, because if they're scattered all over, that tells us there were multiple lineages that got embedded in between, and they're not kind of all pinniped related. So here's some that are, but then you can start seeing their bears in there. So when you do the host phylogeny versus where they're sitting in the phylogeny, we don't see very, very strong congruence in that, other than maybe carnivores and non-carnivores. Now, even in this kind of an environment, this is where one of my collaborators, Chris Buck, becomes very, very uh, adventurous. And we, our work in the Antarctic looking at fish, we start identifying all these very, very unique lineage. And you can see the branches on this. They're very, very long branches compared to this that is found in mammals and the avian species. We find these papillomaviruses in fish. And so Chris Buck at NIH, goes out, there's a truck that pulls in once a week that sells fish, and he goes and buys fish from the truck, and takes it to the lab, a small sliver of it, the rest goes home, and a little bit of it, he starts doing metagenomics on, and he starts discovering all these viruses. And so this is kind of fascinating that you can, your inquiry can be at any point in this environment, but you can still come to some really, really key, important scientific um, conclusions from a lot of these analysis when you pair them with this data with other places on the planet. And finally, I want to kind of reel us into an environment we're sitting in at the moment with monkeypox, but I'm going to talk to you about something else that has happened in the Iberian Peninsula with pretty much rabbits and hares. So Bixoma virus is very common fox virus that infects rabbits. In Australia, they introduced rabbits and they brought in Bixoma virus to control all the rabbits. The rabbits became immune to myxoma virus, and then there was this whole ecological disaster in Australia. And so their biocontrol obviously failed. But here in the Iberian Peninsula, what has been happening is this 10 year boom and bust cycle has been observed. And in this boom and bust cycle, nobody's been able to figure out why all of a sudden the Iberian hares are dying and then they kind of survive and die every 10 year cycle. So in the last cycle, we analyzed the whole of these data the samples. We noticed that compared to what we see in hares in these Iberian, sorry, in rabbits, in these Iberian hares, there are this four gene, four or five gene cassette, four gene cassette that's been introduced. And that's completely changed the pathogenicity of the virus. So basically there's modularity. So a module has just come in, slotted in through recombination. It's changed the host range of the pathogen. So this is kind of important when we're actually doing viral analysis. And this is something that I raised with the group that is studying monkeypox globally at the moment. Do not just take a reference genome and map your reads to it, because what you'll get is exactly what is there. De novo assemble it, because otherwise you're going to be missing these modules. So there are certain important things that we need to think about from these kinds of problems. In this module, we cannot find it in anything that's been sampled today. So this is an area that we're actually kind of like. So where are we going with this? This is where we want to be. We want to study coevolution. We want to try to take all of these viruses, map them, generate networks, map them onto each other. So our fungal viruses evolving with plant viruses, which are also evolving with the vectors insects. So this makes sense because they have a very, very unique ecology. You would think they would evolve together. So this is kind of where we want to go to from here on is to start building these ecological models based on these viruses that have been sampled in nature. And obviously this is all important, kind of Simon's paper, going back almost seven, eight years now, thinking about what they've sampled in the epipelagic environment, we almost reached saturation of sequence space. They go below 200 meters from the epipelagic, they're still in the zone. And this is kind of my weird illustration where if we were to take pretty much all the viruses we know on the planet in terms of sequence space, Kind of map them out on a 10 by 10 grid, collate them. This is all we know about sequence space, all that we do not know. And this kind of is highlighted by this paper that has just come out, that it is amazing that we've always neglected RNA viruses and phages, and all of a sudden, when you start looking for them, they're there. So again, it is the diversity of viruses on the planet is really poorly cataloged, and we're trying our best as not only my group, but a lot of other groups to try to tackle this as best as we can. 
and we're trying to do it more from an evolution perspective. We're interested in the early and deep evolutions of some of these viruses and the modularity that they have in exchanging genetic elements, be the capsid protein or the replication associated protein and how they evolve beyond that. And that gives us some sort of concept into concepts of emergence uh, to think about. Now with that, I'd like to thank a whole variety of people whose work that I presented today involves a variety of collaborators across the board, as well as a variety of students who have worked on the project projects that I have actually tackled. Thank you. Thank you so much and perfectly on time. That's just, I don't know how you do it. Anyway, um, so question in the room or online. If you're online, you should be able to use a Q&A to ask questions in the room. Just raise your hand. Just know that we need to wait for the mic to get to you because otherwise only the people in the room can hear you. The floor is open and that will get my morning workouts all the way in the back. Sorry, just out of curiosity completely, the Anello viruses, um, do they spread from person to person? Like, where, where would you find them in a person if you wanted to, you know, in blood? Uh, where, where, can we grow them in labs? Sorry, so, a bunch of questions. Yeah, so the Anello viruses are found in, in blood in high abundance. And so there are a major problem in blood transfusion. So when people get blood transfusion, they are pretty much moving across into the next host. Now, this replication has been mysterious for a long time. So Ethel Michelle de Villiers has dedicated an entire career to it. But there is a group that has recently identified that they can replicate them in lymphocytes. And they've just sold the three, I think the structure of the capsid protein at about four angstrom by growing them in there and then purifying. They're trying to use them as vectors for gene delivery. We have some more minutes. Any other question? Oh, perfect. Let me give you the mic. Oh, I can also read this. Yeah. Okay. How does this modularity maintain in the viruses and is this host dependent? So I guess the question is like the modularity of the genomes. Why does it get maintained and is this dependent on the hosts? Are there some hosts where the viruses tend to be more modular and some hosts where they don't? And I guess that's kind of also going back to your initial picture of like, why don't we find these viruses in every host? Yeah, I think modularity comes at a, at a cost. It's a high cost because you need to stay together and operate together. But there's also the advantage. So why don't we find them that frequently in nature? I don't know, maybe we haven't looked enough. We're beginning to find them in a variety of different samples. We found them in Pacific uh, flying foxes. We found them in cactus recently. Now, the other thing that we do know about these things are they, in, in some dead end hosts, we get genome reduction and they become replicons. So we're not sure whether it is a sampling bias that we have, or is it that some of these that we're seeing, they just worked and they're on a roll and that's what we've got in a time span. Chances are there were lots more that were there thousands and thousands of years ago, but due to some catastrophic event, there maybe the vector got lost or something that they've just kind of died off in this species. Great, thank you. And thank you for the question. Yeah, last question. Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, one of the one of the interesting thing I saw was the, the the trajectory evolutionary trajectory which comes back like optimum within thirty days. What happens to the other designs? Why are they why were they failed in optimal? Do you, have you studied follow up on that? So we th we haven't followed them. Why the other ones don't? We but what we do know is that the recombination breakpoints are kind of disrupting some of the genes. So as a result, the protein function, and that's the reason why they're kind of collapsing in that area. So it's almost natural selection. So you'll get all the variants are there, but over generations of cycles of replication, they just get bottlenecked to the optimal one because everything else is deleterious. 